نرحب بكم جميعا السلام عليكم اهلا بكم جميعا في هذه المحاضره التي نسال الله ان تكون مفيده وممتعه في الان نفسه المحاضره اللي هي الحلقه الاولى او الجزء الاول من سلسله من المحاضرات واللقاءات العلميه التي تقيمها نواه التنميه العلميه بالتعاون مع الدكتور محمد اكرم فلاح حيكون ضيوفنا مجموعه من كبار علماء الفيزياء بمختلف الاختصاصات العالم الكبير الذي نقف على اكتافه اليوم هو الفيزياء النظري الكبير اباي اشتكا درس في جامعه تكساس في اوسطن وحصل على الدكتوراه من جامعه شيكاغو درس الفيزياء في العديد من الجامعات وتدرج في المراتب الاكاديميه وهو حاليا استاذ اي بروفيسور في الفيزياء في جامعه ولايه بنسلفانيا ويدير معهد التجاذب والكون جرافيتيشن اند كوزموس انستيتيوت في الجامعه نفسها نال العديد من الجوائز فكان اول من حصل على جائزه الجاذبيه التي تمنحها مؤسسة أبحاث الجاذبية في ماساتشوستس ومؤخرا فاز بجائزة أينشتاين التي تمنحها الجمعية الفيزيائية الأمريكية. قائمة المحاضرات واللقاءات والمنشورات التي قدمها البروفيسور أشتكار تطول وتطول ولو أردنا تعدادها لاستهلكنا وقت الجلسة كاملا ولهذا نكتفي بالإشارة إلى كتابين من الكتب التي حررها أولهما 100 سنة من الجاذبية أو من النسبية عفوا 10 years of relativity, space time structure, Einstein and beyond. صادر في عام 2005 في مئوية النسبية الخاصة. وثانيهما هو loop quantum gravity first 30 years الجاذبية الكمومية الحلقية أول 30 عاما من تاريخها. صادر مؤخرا في العام في عام 2017. قبل أن أنقل دفة القيادة إلى الدكتور أكرم في إدارة الجلسة مع الدكتور. اشتكار اود تذكير بعض الاجراءات التنظيميه التي ستساعدنا ان شاء الله على انجاح الجلسه وتعظيم الفائده في المتوقعات منها اولا نطلب من جميع المتابعين اغلاق الكاميرات والميكروفونات لانها فتح لان فتحها سيسبب تشويشا على الحضور وعلى الضيف فلو تكرمتم جميعا اغلاق الكاميرات والميكروفونات في نهايه الجلسه سنفسح مجال للمداخلات والاستفسارات والنقاشات فمن اراد من الافاضل الحضور المداخلة أو توجيه أي سؤال كتابة أو صوتا أو صوتا وصورة فالخيار سيكون متاحا إن شاء الله من أراد الكتابة يمكنه الكتابة في مربع الدردشة وسنوصل السؤال إلى الضيف ومن أراد الحديث يمكن الطلب برفع الهي برفع اليد أسف ريز هان وهو خيار موجود في تطبيق الزوم يتيح, يتيح لنا أو يعطينا أشعارا بأن الحضور يرغبون بالمشاركة والتحدث فنعطي لهم المجال للمداخلة إن شاء الله المداخلات يمكن أن تكون باللغة العربية أو الإنجليزية أو حتى الفرنسية دكتور أكرم سيتولى مشكوراً ترجمة الفرنسية وسنترجم الأسئلة من أي لغة كانت إلى اللغة الإنجليزية ليتولى الضيف الإجابة عنها أشكر لكم حسن أنصاتكم ونتمنى أن يكون لقاء مفيداً وممتعاً في آن المعام معاً دكتور أكرم so I think first uh, you need to start also for the English audience what you said, I mean. Okay. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Abai Eshtikar. He is the director of the Institute of Gravitation and the Cosmos, a Van Bo professor of physics and holder of uh, Eberly Chair at Pennsylvania, Institute, uh, Pennsylvania State University. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago in 1978. He has authored or co-authored over 280 scientific papers and written or co-edited nine scientific books on general relativity, cosmology, and quantum gravity. His research has advanced our understanding of the asymptotic structure of space-time, gravitational waves in full nonlinear general relativity, atomic structure of space-time geometry, at the black scale and the quantum nature of black holes and Big Bang. His reformulation of general relativity as gauge theory has led to loop quantum gravity, uh, an approach to the unification of general relativity and quantum physics that is now being pursued in dozens of research groups worldwide. He has continued to play a seminal role in the development of this field as well as its subfield called loop quantum cosmology. Ashtikar is a member of the US National Academy of Science and a winner of the Einstein Prize of the American Physical Society, given biannually for outstanding contributions 
to gravitational science. He is also one of only 51 honorary fellows of the Indian Academy of Sciences drawn from community of scientists living outside of India. He was awarded the senior Forschung Prize by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and held the Kramers Visiting Chair in Theoretical Physics at the University at the British Science, uh, sorry, at the, uh, Theoretical Physics at the University of Utrecht, Netherlands. A senior visiting fellowship at uh, the British Science and Engineering Research Council and the Sir C. V. Raman Chair of the Indian Academy of Science. He was awarded Dr. Rirum Naturilium uh, Honorius Causia, sorry for not being able to read Latin very good, by the Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, Germany, 2005, and by the Universi University of uh, or de, a de a Marcel de France in 2010. He is a past president of the International Society of uh, or for General Relativity and Gravitation, and a past chair of the Division of Gravitational Physics of uh, the American Physical Society. Dr. Akram. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, so good, um, good evening. And uh, it is for me, um, I mean, it's a great uh, honor for me, I mean, to start this series of interviews and uh, uh, scientific discussions. Um, by the way, just this series of interviews, uh, I mean, uh, is um, for uh, the, the purpose of this, um, I mean, interviews is to construct the bridges between uh, the Arab uh, community, uh, either public or experts, and the great names in theoretical physics or a Nobel uh, Prize laureates. So uh, today we're going to discuss about uh, Einstein theory of general relativity and also some cosmological applications and uh, um, I mean including the Big Bang Theory and what's the problem, the actual problems and uh, some solutions and also one of the um, great um, theories addressing quantum gravity which is uh, loop quantum gravity and uh, today we have really great honor uh, and great pleasure, I mean, to uh, have with us one of the founder of this theory of quantum gravity and really one of the great names in the theoretical physics community. Um, so today with us is uh, Professor Abhay Ashtikar. So uh, let me uh, join, you, uh, join you welcoming Professor Abhay Ashtikar. So hello, Professor. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much. So um, we can start if you want, or you can, I mean, tell a few words to the Arabic community. We have, as I said, most of the people are graduate students uh, in theoretical physics or in physics in general. And uh, also we have professors and some public. So you can start just by telling just a few words, uh, I mean, about, uh, I mean, your uh, presentation. Very nice. So. First of all, it is a great pleasure for me to speak to this community. Uh, I have not kind of very close experience and therefore this is a great opportunity to really interact with you. And I hope that these interactions will continue. Uh, the topic today is going to be about Einstein's theory of general relativity, how it was invented, what are the basic ideas, and then the theory has many interesting uh, applications and really changed our view of the cosmos, in particular through black holes and gravitational waves. But today I'll focus just on cosmology and the idea of the Big Bang, which came from Einstein. And finally, we'll see that even though Einstein's theory of general relativity is so deep, so beautiful, so powerful. It also has some limitations. And then these limitations to overcome them, we will have to bring in quantum mechanics, unify general relativity with quantum physics. And as uh, Mohammed Akram just said, uh, the one of the leading approaches for this is loop quantum gravity. And that is the one that I'm going to use. I was very happy to hear before 
uh, start of the talk that next week, uh, our colleague Kumbrud Wafa from Harvard, who is a strength theorist, would also give a talk. So the audience will have a very broad overview of various leading approaches, what they are telling us and so on. So just by the way, uh, Professor, we have a, a list of people, I mean, who get accept, as I said, uh, one of them is Cameron Vafa, then the second one is Carlo Rovelli. Also, we have Martin Rees after that. But, so I try to make a mixture between, I mean, um, uh, the domain in theoretical physics. So we start with LQG, then we go to string theory, maybe a little bit of discussion about nature of time, then the cosmology with Martin Rees. Wonderful. Martin is, of course, a world leader in particularly the astrophysics and particularly the issues of our black holes. And um, it's really wonderful that you're going to get to get him to speak. So, uh, Professor, I think, um, uh, to be very honest, I mean, uh, one of my, uh, I mean, motivation to discuss with you and to send you this invitation that I was lucky when I was at Perimeter Institute to discuss with this more than one of the founder of LQG, then um, when uh, um, I have also chance to discuss with Carlo Rovelli and Francesca Vidotto when I was teaching in Ghana. So, um, and I was curious really to discuss with the third founder of LQG, which is you. That's why, I mean, uh, I, I am very uh, glad that you are uh, with us uh, today. So maybe we can start about uh, uh, general uh, relativity, if you allow me for just a few introduction. I mean, for just one minute, I mean, and you can go with your uh, slides. I mean, about GR, I mean, about the notion of space and time, uh, if you allow me, of course. Please. Okay. So I think when we discuss physics, uh, I mean, we, uh, we're gonna start by Isaac Newton and uh, uh, Isaac Newton, he is the one, uh, I mean, who uh, start discussing about, uh, I mean, space and time and he used them to formulate the laws of physics. Uh, before that was Aristotle, he uh, was thinking, for example, that the time is the measurement of change. And uh, after that, I mean, Isaac Newton, he is the only one who believed that even there is no change, he changed uh, the uh, school of thought and uh, um, um, he uh, believed that and convinced everybody that even there is no change, there is a, a time. So, and he called it um, absolute time and I mean, uh, also absolute space and this uh, structures, I mean, and all the dynamics of other physical system, it's, I mean, relative to this absolute space and time. So maybe at some point when you read some philosophical books, I mean, you will find that uh, Isaac Newton was, um, I mean, adopted the uh, religious uh, point of view of his professor, Isaac Barrow. But after that, in the meantime, there is a guy called Leibniz and he was, I mean, against this picture and find that if you want to determine all the physical quantities, I mean, of any physical system, you need to discuss this with the relation of other physical system and this um, new physical, um, uh, and this new uh, school of thought is called relationalism or what he writes, relation theory of space and time. And this is what Einstein, uh, after that in 1905, I mean, uh, maybe adopt this philosophical idea. And he, uh, he, um, uh, I mean, he changed the, um, the notion or uh, at the fundamental level of space and time and they becomes uh, relative or I prefer personal. After that, I mean, um, uh, after 1905, we have also Einstein, when he construct Einstein uh, special relativity, he found that the laws of gravitation of uh, Isaac Newton, he is contradicting in some way with his simultaneity principle. So um, he uh, knows that he, um, he should construct a new theory of gravitation basic on this new theory of relativity. And in 1915, I mean, he found uh, this uh, nice theory of general relativity. And 
um, uh, this also based on the merging or the um, fusion between space and time. So, uh, Professor um, uh, Abhay Ashtikar, he will start discussing first about uh, the discovery of general relativity and about what's uh, the revolution of this theory and maybe what's the problems, I mean, of this, or maybe what's the application. So, you can start, uh, Professor, with your slides, I mean, now. Thank you. Okay. So, as uh, Akram just told us, we, uh, Einstein discovered special theory of relativity in 1905, in which space and time fuse into a four-dimensional continuum, and Newton's idea of absolute time and, uh, is abolished. There's a loss, loss of absolute time um, of, of Newton's that was already abolished in space and relativity. Then two years later, while writing a review article, Einstein realized that there is a tension between Newtonian gravity and the new theory of space-time, which at that time was spatial relativity. The reason is because in Newtonian gravity, there is an absolute time. If I actually move an object, then instantaneously, the gravitational field changes all over the universe. So therefore Einstein started looking for a resolution and therefore a new theory of space-time and gravitation. This was an incredibly bold idea. It is not easy to sort of really, even for experts to fully understand how brave Einstein was in looking for this idea. So he persisted from 1907 and finally finished in 1915. But in between, in 1913, after he had already worked on this for six years, Max Planck, who is here with Einstein, uh, visited Einstein in Zurich, that is where Einstein was, and asked him what he was doing. So Einstein explained that he is looking for a new theory of space-time and gravitation because of the tension between spatial relativity and Newtonian gravity. And this is what Planck said. Planck, as you know, is the founder of quantum mechanics. He was the most respected um, German scientist at the time. He said, as an older friend, I must advise you against it, against trying this. For in the first place, you will not succeed. And even if you succeed, no one will believe you. So it took great courage for Einstein to ignore this advice. And for opportunity for us, he did. And in 1915, he found the general theory of relativity. And so, in November of 1916, when he actually wrote, um, uh, he, he said that during the last month, I experienced one of the most exciting and most exacting, his hardest, a lot, lot of demanding um, times of my life. Most exciting and most exacting times of my life. True enough, also one of the most successful. And then he goes on to explain that although he started from this conceptual problem of unifying spatial relativity with Newtonian gravity and therefore a new theory of space and time and gravitation, it really has some applications in particular it solved a old problem which had to do with the orbit of the planet Mercury. Well, he sent this letter to Sommerfeld who was the theoretical physics physicist in Germany. He had the chair of theoretical physics in Munich. And Sommerfeld was very surprised because Einstein generally was very uh, sober, was not uh, exaggerating anything. And he thought that this was really uh, showing a lot of emotion. But then after some correspondence, Einstein told Sommerfeld of general theory of relativity, you'll be convinced once you are studying it. Therefore, I'm not going to defend it with a single word. And those of, who, those of us who actually work in general relativity, use it every day, explore it every day, find its consequences, really feel it is true. It's really a very beautiful theory. So what are the basic ideas of general relativity, just for the students who may not know? The idea is the following, that until, I mean, the ideas of space and time were developed long, long time ago. And in particular, Aristotle had books on physics four books, one, two, three, four, in which he had laid down the Aristotelian view of space and time, which is what Newton had learned when he first started. Since then, 
space time always what is an inert background or a stage on which various things happen. Planets move, fields propagate, particles interact, and so on. But now, in general relativity, space time becomes a physical entity. It is no longer a background or a stage. It can be acted upon and it reacts. Matter can bend space time, and the bend space time influences the motion of matter. Gravitational field is now encoded. It's not a force, but it is really encoded in the very geometry of space time. And this is possible because, like geometry, gravity is omnipresent, it is everywhere. There is no place in the universe where you can switch off gravity. You can switch off electromagnetic fields, and we are labs which do that to do some delicate experiments, but you cannot switch off gravity. So it's omnipresent, and also it is non-discriminating. That is to say, it acts exactly the same on all objects. So in general relativity, for example, a heavy body like sun, which is in the center here of this picture, it bends space-time, and light bodies like a planet, like Earth, go around it. So Earth is trying to go as straight as it can, but because space-time itself is bent, from a Newtonian perspective, it looks like Earth has a curved orbit that we describe in Newtonian physics. So matter tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells matter how to move, and geometry is intertwined with matter via Einstein's equation. As I said, this theory is really, really very beautiful. And here are two quotes. I don't want to read them in full. But basically, Hermann Weyl, a very famous mathematical physicist of the first half of 20th century, he really put it in words what we all feel. It is as if a wall that separated us from truth has collapsed. Wider expanses and greater depths are now exposed to the searching eye of knowledge, regions of which we had not even appreciated. We never even dreamt of such a thing. And then S. Chandrasekhar, who was a preeminent astrophysicist of 20th century, compared general relativity with the famous sculptures, in particular sculptures of Michelangelo, the Pieta is being shown here, and says that you see new aspects of beauty are revealed at every scale in great sculptures as well as in general relativity. And therefore, general relativity really accounts for, a, not only is it a beautiful theory, but it accounts for a large array of phenomena from our solar system. These are some plots about corrections to Newtonian gravity. Uh, here is a double pulsar. These are beams of lights that are coming out, and one needs general relativity to understand these systems. Here you've got gravitational lensing, one needs general relativity to understand that. And then we've got many other astrophysical phenomena like black holes eating eating up and so on. And similarly here, um, this is the famous picture that you might have seen because the 2020 Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of black holes, particularly in the center of our galaxy. And this picture from the center of our galaxy was really shown very, very much. So this is the short introduction to general relativity. And then we can go on perhaps to the next topic. If there are urgent questions, I can also answer them. So thank you so much, uh, Professor. I mean, for uh, the general relativity, I mean, but I mean, what do you think that the main uh, actual uh, problems, I mean, of general relativity, I mean, depends. Right. Yes. So we, in the next part, a few, few topics that we are going to see now, we are going to see that, uh, let me just, yeah. Uh, we are going to see that, um, um, that even though general relativity is so beautiful, it has very severe limitations, and that is what we're going to see I want to with ex specific examples. Uh, Professor, before you go to the next point, I have just a curiosity. I mean, if you go, um, I mean, to the, uh, I mean, the books or um, of Einstein or the correspondence of um, uh, Albert Einstein and also Minkowski, I mean, after 1905 or maybe in 1907, I mean, Minkowski, uh, at the level of special relativity, he, uh, I mean, suggests that maybe uh, the best idea is to uh, reformulate uh, special relativity by mixing between space and time in four-dimensional uh, vector space, uh, I mean, which is uh, after that is Minkowski space or uh, the space-time. 
but at th that level, I mean, uh, when you read, I mean, the correspondence between Einstein and Minkowski, he replied to him that uh, he doesn't want this complication, mathematical complication. And, and uh, after that, I mean, uh, he realized, I mean, with his friend Grossman, that he, it's a necessity to, uh, for him when he wants to uh, construct a theory for gravitation to mix or fuse space and time. Do you think why? I mean, at some point, Einstein, I mean, uh, was obliged to fuse between space and time uh, when he think about gravity, if you have any idea. Yeah, so. So it really is, I, I, you, you summarized it very well. I, so basically when Minkowski first wrote these papers, as you said, Einstein even commented that, well, now that mathematicians have taken over the subject, uh, I hardly understand it. So, but then when he, that was at the level of special theory of relativity. But then when he started to, to come to terms with this problem, which was the problem that I ex explained at the beginning, the problem which has to do with the tension between Newtonian paradigm and loss of absolute time in space and relativity, this, the correspondence with Minkowski space was before 1907 or around that time. Once he realized that, or around that time actually, once he realized that, then he wanted to understand how to incorporate general relativity and therefore to, inca to, 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 sorry, to incorporate gravitation in the notions of space and time, no simultaneity and so on, that was given by um, by uh, space relativity. And it is at that time that he realized, oops, I don't know what, just one second. Yeah, at that time he realized that in fact, because gravitational field is really every, omnipresent, it's everywhere and it's non-discriminating, therefore perhaps gravitational field is not a force, this famous thing that you hear about in an elevator here, one day he had this realization, that if you are freely falling, you would not experience a gravitational field. It is at that time when you realize that gravitational field is different from other forces of nature that he started thinking about really that it has to be incorporated in the very geometry of space and time. And the two principal reasons are the ones which are given here, which is really that gravity is omnipresent, just like space time geometry is omnipresent, and it acts the same for electricity and magnetism force on positive charge is opposite of that of negative charge. Whereas in gravity, mass is always positive and the force is always attractive. So these two characteristics, namely non-discriminating and omnipresent is what really led Einstein to, um, to the conclusion that somehow gravity should be incorporated in the geometry. And then he went back to Minkowski and as you said, with his friend Marcel Grossman, learned elements of differential geometry. And then finally, constructed general theory of relativity. Okay, professor, thank you so much. So maybe, um, I mean, for saving time, we can go ahead with the cosmological application of GR. Right. So as I mentioned that once you say that space and time is a physical entity, it changes, it is not given to you once and for all, then completely new phenomena develop. And I don't have today time to discuss black holes and gravitational waves. If you have questions during the questions period, you can ask me something about it. But I want to focus on cosmology. So once you say that space and time is a physical entity and it is changing, it is not eternal, it is not just fixed once and for all like a stage, then one wants to know how it can change. And really it is true that in a literal sense, kind of a mathematical theory of cosmology really began with general relativity. So Newton had the great idea and great courage to say that the force that makes the apple fall from a tree on earth is the same as the force that makes the planets go around. It's a huge jump when you think about it. But Einstein's jump was even bigger. His ideas of general relativity were really obtained by looking at the solar system and so on, and maybe perihelion of Mercury. But he applied principle of general relativity to the universe as a whole. And when we do that, one finds that 
geometry of space-time is indeed a dynamical entity. It is not fixed. And the evolution of geometry is governed by Einstein's equation. And Einstein's equation figuratively say that the space-time curvature, the left-hand side of Einstein's equation, which is a geometrical object, is given by the right-hand side, which has information from matter. And then once you have got this Einstein's equation, and you add to that the observation that on a sufficiently large scale, space-time is homogeneous. There is no preferred place in the universe. And isotropic, there is no preferred direction on a sufficiently large scale. Then immediately these equations imply that geometry must be dynamical and related to matter. And the universe must have that begun with a big bang about 13.8 billion years ago. But this is what we now know and with sort of every student and every textbook says, says about these things. But in fact, the issue of the beginning has had a very curious history. It is not something that we really, not many people know about. Einstein and De Sitter, two years after the discovery of general relativity, constructed models of the universe. In these models, there is no beginning and there is no end and there is no singularity, there is no big bang. <coughs> the universe is eternal. Its spatial topology is closed. It is that of a three-dimensional sphere. And this is the picture in which time is running around here and space is in these directions. Of course, we have to suppress one dimension in order to draw the figure. Space is three-dimensional. Here it is depicted by two dimensions only. And then the statement is that the universe is really eternal. But then in, in, in between 1921 and 24, Friedman, and independently, but later, Lemaitre discovered other solutions in which the universe actually has a finite beginning. Basically, there's a picture again, time is running up and space is in this horizontal direction. And the idea is that space time the universe is expanding as you go back, as you go forward in time. Therefore, as you go back in time, the universe would be contracting. And therefore, as it contracts and contracts and contracts, then the equation predicts that at some stage, it really reaches a point at which the energy density becomes infinite. The curvature of space-time becomes infinite. The space-time continuum, as we know it, tears and classical physics just stops. And this is the Big Bang. Now, there were lot, many twists and turns about Big Bang. It was not at all accepted. I think it is important for students to know this, that it took a long time for Big Bang to come to be accepted. And in January 1930, in a meeting of the Royal Society, Eddington, in fact, was only considering these two models of space-time, which were given to us by Einstein and De Sitter without any beginning and so on. And these models had some limitations. Einstein's model was static. There was no time, time in it. Whereas in De Sitter's model, there is no matter at all in it. So they have both had limitations. And Eddington was asking, can we somehow remove those limitations? But Lametra then, who had already written these papers and had also spent some time in, um, in, um, uh, in Cambridge with Eddington, wrote to Lady Eddington saying that, well, there was, in fact, he had already found such solutions which have matter as well as expansion. And this letter really made Eddington realize it. And Eddington, after that, really supported this idea of the Big Bang. But there are philosophical and aesthetic preferences. For example, George Gamble, in, in, as we'll see in a minute, uh, from considerations of nuclear physics, sort of realized that there, there was a Big Bang and there was a reason for it. And the universe probably began, you know, sometime in the finite uh, past, uh, according to general relativity. And then he wrote to Pope Pius XII, um, who, who saying that, well, maybe religion and science are coming together because there was a finite beginning to the universe. But Lemaitre, who was a Jesuit priest and was also the director then later of the Vatican Observatory, convinced Pope Pius not to mix science and philosophy, science and religion and let the two things be separate from each other. And indeed, Pope Pius, to his credit, dropped these references of to religion and Bible and so on, and just, just you know, kept, it, kept the two things separate. But there was a program in, so in the Soviet Union by Lipschitz, 
the co-author of Landau Lifshitz, Kalatnikov, and then more recently it was uh, uh, joined by, um, uh, uh, the, 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 more recently it was joined by other people. And in the late 50s at that time, it was believed that this program sort of was aimed at saying that Big Bang is artificial. It is because of high symmetry and the real world, this Big Bang would not exist. This is only an exceptional unphysical solution. And then the British school was led by Bondi, Gold, Hoyle, Shyama, and Narlikar and so on. They really liked very much a steady state universe in which the universe was eternal, but to, to make the universe eternal, they had to create, create continuously matter. And for some reason, they thought that it was important for the universe to be steady and not changing in time and that to really introduce these ad hoc ideas of creation of matter. But these ideas were really being were followed. And it really was from this mathematics and aesthetics to physics, the big change took place was in the 1950s and 60s. And that was because of nuclear synthesis. So it sounds very strange because nuclear synthesis has nothing to do with the space and time, Big Bang. But what people realized was that the heavy elements we see in the universe are probably created in the stars as the stars burn their nuclear fuel. But the lighter elements were not created in stars. There were, there were not enough stars to create the abundance of the light elements, helium, lithium, and so on. And therefore, they realized that there must have been a hot epoch in the early phase of the universe where these elements were cooked, so to say. And therefore, the, this epoch might have something that would naturally come about if we had a big bang. And then if there was such a hot epoch, then it, it should be, there should be a relic of it seen even today, which was in the microwave background, the CMB, and then Dickie Peebles, Earl Wilkinson really looked at, worked out the details of this uh, primordial radiation left over when the radiation decoupled from matter. And this is really what happened. And this is the cosmic wave microwave background. So again, time is running in, in, the, in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction is space. And here is a picture. We are here today, all the satellites and so on. And the idea is that the very early epoch, very early times up here, the universe was opaque. Uh, to, to, uh, light could not escape. The, the universe was too hot. Things were happening between the interaction between matter and, and radiation was going on. When by the time the universe had cooled, that is about 380,000 years ago, sufficiently as it expanded, it cooled, the atoms could be formed. And then once the atoms could be formed, this is sometimes called recombination, that universe becomes transparent. And then the statement is that light could really escape. And this is the primordial light that, you know, from the cosmic microwave background, when the universe was only 380,000 years young, according to general relativity. And there has been a spectacular success over the last two, two, two or three decades. There were missions called Kobe, WMAP, and Planck. So here is a cosmic microwave background explorer, Kobe, launched in 89. Here is a Wilco Wilson microwave, an astronomical pro probe, launched in 2001. And what they did, all these probes did, was to really understand more and more detailed properties of this microwave background. And once these properties were understood, and, and then more re most recently, it was Planck satellite, which was launched in 2009. And the last, sorry, the last release data, this is wrong, was 2018. Um, and then that is what we know today about the, um, about the universe. So the point is that the cosmic microwave background, so universe is bathed in this cosmic microwave background. This came about when the universe was cut up in, in a thermal equilibrium about 380,000 years ago. And the, and the universe is quite hot at then, but as the universe expands, it cools. And so as seen today, the temperature is, up, is very low, is about 2.73 Kelvin. And that is why one needs this high technology and satellites to see this microwave background. But one can see how much power there is, how much energy intensity there is per unit wavelength and frequency up here, and it has a perfect black body curve. It is so beautiful because the theoretical curve and the observational data points lie completely on the top of it. It is perfect, it's really fantastic black body radiation. But 
there were tiny inhomogeneities. As we can see on this picture, there are tiny inhomogeneities and there are only one part in 100,000. And the interesting thing, and this really is something for students of physics, you should really get thrilled with this, that these tiny inhomogeneities in the cosmic wave by microwave background means that the universe was a little bit hotter somewhere, a little bit colder somewhere. And therefore a little bit denser somewhere and a little bit less dense somewhere. And as I said before, gravity is attractive and therefore denser regions attract more matter and they become bigger and bigger and the less dense region, regions lose matter because that matter is pulled away by gravity of the dense region where the gravity becomes stronger and stronger and therefore that leads to a structure. So basically this is something that happened 380,000 when the universe was 380,000 years young. So more than 13 billion years ago and that these inhomogeneities under, uh, under laws that are known, particularly general relativity and astrophysics, they grow into the inhomogeneities that are seen today. So this really is a true triumph of general relativity, namely going from here to here. So if you look at what the universe now is about 13.8 billion years, and at that time it was about 380,000 years, if you take the ratio, it is the same as one day to 100 years. So this is in human terms then, this is like taking a snapshot of a baby, this is a baby universe, but in human terms, taking snapshot of a baby just one day after the birth and proving an accurate profile of the human being 100 years, when the human being will be 100 years old. This is really fantastic, right? Imagine how much biology, bi bi biochemistry, physiology, <clears throat> you would have to know to be able to do that. We're very, 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 very far from having such knowledge of biology. But for the universe as a whole, we have no known laws of physics and astrophysics, which actually tell us that this evolved into this. And this should give you a thrill because this really shows power of physics and power of today's science. So this is really the second part, which has to do with the, the birth of space and time in general relativity. Let me just go immediately to this, the next part because uh, it has to, and then maybe Akram can stop me again. Namely, the necessity to bring in quantum physics up here. So all this was really done mostly without worrying about quantum mechanics. This quantum mechanics used indirectly in astrophysics, but not strongly. So, so far we applied general relativity to cosmology, but ignore the fundamentals of quantum physics. And this is justified because we focused only on the large scale structure and ignored what has happened in the early era when the universe was only 380,000 years old, or before it was this, this universe was this old. But this does not provide us any real understanding of the origin of the tiny inhomogeneity of the cosmic microwave background. We just had to accept that these seeds of inhomogeneity, these seeds that we saw up here, we just had to accept that they existed. Once they existed, then they grew here. But we have to explain how these seeds came into being in the first place. And this is something that has been now quite nicely understood over the last 30 years. The issue of the beginning, it really was pushed back to the cosmic microwave background era, but we need quantum physics for a deeper and more complete understanding. And this is what has happened in the last 30 years. And the, there are many paradigms. I don't want to say inflation has been established, but I just want to choose one because it is a leading paradigm that the origin of this inhomogeneity in, in is. In other words, how did this inhomogeneity come into being here is a question. And they evolved from something else. And the idea is that soon after the Big Bang, inflation assumed that there was a Big Bang, the universe underwent a phase of rapid expansion. And then at the onset of the universe was completely homogeneous except for ever-present vacuum fluctuations, which cannot be got rid of even in principle because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So the point is that if you have a field like electromagnetic field, classically you can have zero electric and magnetic fields, but quantum mechanically, electric and magnetic fields are operators and they do not commute, just like the position and the momentum operators, they don't commute. So you cannot make them simultaneously zero, and the best you can do is that the expectation values are zero, but, and there are tiny fluctuations. 
And these fluctuations in the very early universe, according to inflation, as the universe expands, these fluctuations are stretched and they become fluctuations in the microwave background. And then through classical gravity, we get this. So there's a new cosmogenesis that this in homogeneities came into being from the quantum vacuum fluctuations. So therefore it really is quantum nothingness. Vacuum is like quantum nothingness. I mean, classically nothingness means zero fields, but quantum mechanically, you cannot have zero fields, you have vacuum fluctuations, and that is what gave rise to this thing. So this is where we, we, we are. But then the statement is that, and this is coming back to Akram's question, already quantum mechanics is essential, but in fact, we need to go even before inflation, beyond inflation. That is to say, we want to know what happened even before the onset of this expanding phase. So as we just saw that the CAB in homogeneities arise in inflation scenario because of fundamental Heisenberg uncertainties. And this is all inspiring, but fundamental problems still remain. Inflation continues to assume that space-time geometry is still given by general relativity and then incorporates small quantum corrections. There is still a big bang with infinite matter density and curvature. Space-time ends and inflationary physics just throws up its hands and comes to a halt. We need a more complete union of quantum, quantum physics and gravity, and that is quantum gravity. And so the general expectation is that we cannot test general relativity in the Planck regime. We must incorporate quantum physics also for gravity, that is to say also for geometry. Big Bang is a prediction of general relativity, but precisely in a domain where it is inapplicable. Classical singularities, therefore, are really gates to physics beyond Einstein. Any viable quantum gravity theory should answer the question, what really happened in the Planck regime? In the standard model, cosmic microwave background occurs 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and therefore this cosmic microwave background is far from being a proof that the Big Bang ever occurred, although in popular press, it is often said there is a proof of the Big Bang. It is not at all so. And the question we want to ask is, does quantum physics really stop if we went even further back? Is there a finite beginning? And if so, uh, and if not, if there was no finite beginning, what was there before the general relativity era of the Big Bang? And just to conclude this part, I just want to say that Einstein himself was quite aware of these limits of general relativity. In 1945, meaning of relativity, he wrote, one may not assume the validity of field equations, that is Einstein's equations. One may not assume the validity of Einstein's equations at very high density of field and matter. And one may not conclude that the beginning of the expansion should be a singularity in the mathematical sense. So, this is the statement and this is where we are. And then with, with the last short part, we'll talk about physics beyond Einstein, if there is interest. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Professor, for this part. But just I have a few um, maybe questions or discussions about this point. So um, for uh, the necessity that there is a beginning point or starting point of uh, the universe, I mean, if you view this kind uh, of thing in different way, I mean, in um, uh, I think you uh, you know this uh, the past hypothesis. I mean, in uh, or the second law of thermodynamics of uh, Boltzmann. So um, this uh, uh, law, I mean, uh, as all body know, I mean, is described the entropy, which is uh, a physical quantity. Uh, I mean, measure the uh, uh, um, I mean disorder. So, and Boltzmann uh, proved that this um, law is always, or this quantity is always increasing from the past to the future. And when he, you ask him why it's increasing, he said, because it was low in the past. And why it's low in the past before? Because it, it was very low in the, I mean, until you trace back to uh, a single point, that's why at some point, I mean, uh, when you uh, discuss with um, the second law of thermodynamics, I mean, what do you think about the past hypothesis and the necessity of the uh, beginning point, which is the Big Bang in the general relativity? So 
I think the past hypothesis, in my view, is necessary. You need to assume that the initial conditions, in my view, were really special. Um, and the question is then, what were these initial conditions and how special they were and how they came about? And Roger Penrose, in this respect, has sort of proposed some ideas which had to do with the, which, which was, I was very fascinated by those ideas. I followed, tried to follow them in great detail, tried to even obtain a kind of mechanical derivation of those ideas, um, which is to say that, yes, the initial conditions were very special and in particular, space-time curvature has two parts. One is called the Ricci part. Einstein equation says us, tells us that the Ricci part of the curvature is really determined by matter, but there is also wild part. So even if you have no matter at all, for example, in gravitational waves, uh, you just have pure gravitational waves, the wild curvature is not zero, Ricci curvature is still zero. And so in some sense, gravitational degrees of freedom, pure gravitational degrees of freedom, heuristically, you can say they reside in the Ricci part, and uh, so they reside in the wild part, and the Ricci part is this, this kind of matter. Okay, so Penrose's hypothesis is that the initial singularity, the beginning, the past hypothesis is really that the wild tensor is zero in the beginning. So that's a very special idea, there's a very special configuration, and that should happen. And I think I, you know, um, um, I, I think along the similar lines, except that because I want to talk about physics beyond Einstein up here, um, then really you cannot take, you cannot really talk about uh, um, the, the uh, you cannot say that the wild tensor is identically zero. As I just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, electric field and magnetic field, classically, they both can be zero. But quantum mechanically, there is an uncertainty principle because electric field doesn't commute to the magnetic field. Exactly the same thing is true with the wild tensor. You can divide the wild tensor into an electric part and a magnetic part, and the two don't commute. And therefore, you cannot have zero wild curvature. What you could have is really the expectation value of the wild curvature to be the tensor, um, uh, the operator, to be zero, and the fluctuations to be very, as small as they could be. And that would give us an initial condition. And in fact, in the re recent years, uh, Luke quantum gravity people, particularly in the group in Luke quantum cosmology that I've been associated with, they have used such a past hypothesis with special initial condition to really say what really then happened after that. Right? As if you start with such a such special conditions, then what predictions do you get? And these are the predictions that if there is interest, I will explain the fourth part. But if, you know, we're, we're taking some time already, uh, it's true that almost the first 20 minutes were spent in introductions and, 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 uh, and so on. Uh, but still, I can either continue, I can stop after your questions. I, I, anything is fine with me. Yes, I just have uh, the last, uh, I mean, questions or maybe uh, something. I mean, before you can go, Professor, with the physics beyond Einstein. I mean, uh, they said, I mean, I heard uh, um, that uh, Einstein, after 1915, uh, he wasn't satisfied about the, uh, the space-time itself or the space-time uh, which he uh, constructs in uh, general relativity because he knows a uh, Heisenberg principle so far, which is uh, the relation, the second one, which is the relation between you know, the uncertainty between energy and time. So if really uh, focus, if you try to measure the gravitational field at the Planck scale, for example, and when you use, I mean, Heisenberg principle, so how, what you will have, you will have delta x and delta m is greater or equal to h bar over two. So now each time you want to um, measure the field or the po any position on the gravitational field at that scale, you will create uh, um, what's called a black hole. Why? Because delta x, if you uh, measure it very precisely, I mean the x, you will create infinite uh, m, which is you will create a black hole. So. Uh, um, at some point, at deep level, when you try to uh, use the space-time uh, uh, to measure the gravitational physics at Planck scales, I mean space-time is doomed at some point. 
So he uh, was thinking that maybe his space time is just an approximation of another structure of space time. I mean, by merging quantum theory and uh, general relativity. So what do you think about this? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, so I would think I completely, I'm very sympathetic with that point of view. And I do think that it's an approximation and classical space time is an like approximation and there are, uh, um, that will come about only in some spacious circumstances. Fortunately, all the circumstances that we encounter around us are such that classical space time perfectly makes sense. But in extreme situations like near the Big Bang or the black hole singularity, this description will just break down and will need quantum, full quantum theory um, completely. Uh, it would become completely essential in those regimes. So I, I, I completely agree with that point of view. Um, and in terms of measurements, yes, direct measurement may not be possible. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we don't, uh, we can have indirect measurements. I mean, you know, like for example, um, you can, just like what, in fact, Einstein himself did with Brownian motion, right? He, he, he looked at the Brownian motion, not by looking at individual molecules and seeing what they are, but in fact, saying that those properties of individual molecules induce something that you can actually observe. And the same thing is true, I believe, in uh, gravity, that in fact, for example, black hole entropy is a gateway that tells us a hint about what the microstructure of space time should be like. So we can use these indirect hints, not direct measurement, but indirect hints to really understand what the building blocks of space time are. Yes. So I think uh, I am done. Um, I don't know. There is some one question, I mean, in the audience part, I mean, okay. the chat, uh, I mean, with these slides, but I don't know if you allow to ask this question now. Sure, or... sure, sure. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's up to you. I mean, it's completely up to you. I, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, I don't yes. have to. But it's in this part, I think it's important. So, uh, Nidal Salama, he said, what is the difference between the singularity of Big Bang and that singularity of black hole? Very good. So, the, uh, mathematically, we know that they are quite different from each other in the following sense. As I mentioned before, the curvature of space-time, which encapsulates the strength of gravitational field, like, it has two components, and this is a mathematical characterization that came from deep mathematical structures of Riemannian geometry. And it has a part, so if like curvature tensor four dimensions has 20 components, and 10 of them are called Ritchie part, and 10 of them are called the wild part. And as I said, the Ritchie part is completely determined by matter, whereas the mild part is only indirectly determined. In particular, you may have no matter at all, just gravitational waves, so Ritchie part would be zero, and yet the wild part would not be zero. So the black hole singularity is the one in which there is no matter near the black hole singularity. So it is the wild tensor that blows up in the, in the, in the matter part. Whereas the Big Bang singularity, there's of course matter, universes, galaxies, matter, all kinds of matter there. It, it could also be radiation. And it is the matter part of the singularity that blows up. The near the Big Bang, the Ritchie tensor becomes infinite, or at the Big Bang, it becomes infinite, and the wild tensor is zero. Whereas in a black hole singularity, it's of a very different kind. In the black hole singularity, the wild tensor diverges, whereas the rigid tensor is identically zero. And this is really what led Roger uh, Penrose to make this wild curvature hypothesis. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. So I think uh, uh, for saving time, so maybe we can go ahead with the physics beyond. Okay. And then we can go to the question. Of the the other question. Okay. So let me just go, go to this and maybe I'll be a little bit quicker here, but you tell me. Hmm. So in the basic idea, now I'm going to explain everything in the framework of loop quantum gravity. As I said, uh, this is one of the approaches. And as I could have said in the introduction, uh, there's a, another approach, string theory, but I'm here going to be for concrete reasons. And, and because of time, just focus on loop quantum gravity. So in loop quantum gravity, the viewpoint is the following. That there are conceptual difficulties associated with unifying 
quantum physics with gravity, with general relativity, because in general relativity, gravity is encoded in the geometry of space and time itself. And therefore, quantum theory of gravity is also a quantum theory of geometry. So it's very strange, but we are led to believe, ask the questions like, what are the atoms of geometry? How do they fit together to give us a continuum under normal circum circumstances? So this is the kind of question that was just being asked back. Can quantum gravity provide us with equations that still hold at and beyond the Big Bang where the continuum breaks down, it tears, and classical physics actually stops. So this might seem strange, and it should seem strange when you hear of first that are the atoms of geometry. But the point is that geometry is a physical entity, you know, just like everything, like, like the screen in front of you or like a piece of paper in front of you. And the point is that the screen looks like a continuous um, entity, but you know that it, the screen is made out of atoms. You just put it under an electron microscope and you will see that it has atomic discrete structure. So similarly, space-time geometry is a physical entity, so it should have constituents, and it's only because we don't probe microscopic structure that we can approximate it with a continuum. And then when does a quantum geometry effect become important? So when are these microscopic structures, atoms of geometry are going to become important? So from the fundamental constants of nature, which would enter the quantum theory of gravity, Newton's constant of gravity, speed of light, and Planck's constant h bar, you can actually construct a unique length, and that length is about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So it is it is sets the scale at which Einstein continuum completely breaks down. You cannot use it blindly, you have to understand it used in a physically sensible manner. But basically, this scale is extremely strong, extremely small. For example, the Planck length is so, this is called the Planck length, and it is really small, even com com compared to the subatomic world. For example, the radius of a proton divided by the Planck length is about 10 to the 20. And 10 to the 20 was the US budget uh, for, it would be the US budget for 10 million years at the, at the rate of 2017. I mean, it just took some, some number that I could find. So just to give you an idea about how small, it, how, the proton is absolutely enormous compared to the Planck length. And the quantum effects of gravity are really going to happen there. And that is why even in accelerator physics and so on, it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to find traces of quantum gravity. <laughs> these are extremely tiny scales, but they, if these effects come to forefront at extremely high curvature, we cannot create such curvature in the laboratory, but near the Big Bang inside black holes, we do have such curvature. For example, the density of matter which will create such a curvature is about 10 to the 94 grams per cubic centimeters. The nuclear density, which is the highest density, for example, in neutron stars, is about 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter. So there is a, almost 80 orders of magnitude difference in, in here. So loop quantum gravity is a theory which tries to meet the challenges and it is really being followed by all, you know, all over the world, by many, many countries, about two dozen groups are following this. And the idea here is the following. <clears throat> it retains the Einstein's fusion of geometry and gravity, but uses quantum geometry. So geometry is now itself quantum mechanical. It's not like a smooth continuum geometry, but it has elements of quantum mechanics. It knows about Planck's constant h bar. Not only matter, but space and time are also quantum mechanical from birth. And there are new, brand new mathematical conceptual tools that we have to introduce. And that is what was done by the community in the 1990s uh, without assuming space-time continuum. And the key consequences are that the fundamental excitations of geometry, like the fundamental excitations of the electromagnetic field are photons, here, the fundamental excitations are one-dimensional and it's like polymer-like and space-time is literally woven by this one-dimensional threats. Einstein continuum is only an approximation. And so I like to give the following analogy. Just look at your shirt. You know, for all practical purposes, the shirt is a fabric and it looks like a smooth continuum. But in this case, you just have to take a magnifying glass and look at the shirt and you can see that it is woven by one dimensional threads. But the threads are so packed together 
that gave us the illusion of a two-dimensional continuum. The idea is that the same is true with space-time. It really is over by this fundamental building fibers, but they are so tightly packed that we think of it as a continuum. So therefore, what happens is near the Big Bang is that the continuum picture breaks down. It's not that physics breaks down, but the continuum picture breaks down. You cannot keep using the fabric of your shirt. You have to use the fundamental objects, the threads themselves. You have to use equations that govern these individual quantum threads and say what happens. So equations of blue quantum, quantum gravity do not break down. There are major departures from Einstein's equations, but the beauty of it, is, which surprises me greatly because I, I didn't, when we first found it, I didn't even believe it. The beauty of it is that under all normal conditions, Einstein's equation continuum approximation is perfectly fine. They break down only in the deep Planck regime when the curvatures and, its, and densities are very, very high, like densities of 10 to the 94 grams per cubic centimeter, very, very high. And then there is a brand new physics. But the interesting thing is again, that these effects rise very rapidly with this curvature and then die also with this curvature. For example, there's a maximum, the curvature in blue quantum gravity or blue quantum cosmology cannot really grow unboundedly. There is, a, uh, there is an upper bound. The upper bound is huge. It is about 10 to the 78 times the curvature on the surface of a solar mass black hole. So it's absolutely huge, but it's finite. In general relativity, <coughs> the curvature blo blows up. Whereas in loop quantum cosmology, all physical quantities remain finite. And here is a cover story from New Scientist from Big Bang to Big Bounce that you might be interested in. And here's a picture that I will run a few times to explain to you what happens. So this is for people who know a little bit about inflation. In inflation, you've got a scalar field that rolls down a potential. And as it rolls down the potential, in the future, the universe actually expands. But if you go back in time, the universe will contract it. So what happens up here? So let's just go back and see what happens. Oops. Yeah. So th this is rolling down and this is the volume of the universe. As you go back in time, it is decreasing, 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 but it doesn't go to zero. It stops and then, in fact, it starts increasing again, as you can see up here. It starts increasing again. So there's a big bounce instead of a big bang. As you go back in the past, the volume decreases and then starts increasing again. Or the energy density in the universe, as you go back in the past, increases but doesn't become infinite. It reaches a maximum value, about 4.1 Planck density, and then comes down again. So here's a picture, artist impression of, big, of, of the big bounce. Our branch of the universe is this future branch. Again, time is running up. And this is this section up here, you see the spatial section. In the future, the space time is expanding. And these are kind of astrophysical bodies up here. And the distance between them is growing as the universe expands. If you go back in time, the distance contracts. But until you use, use the, big, uh, the big bounce, it contracts. But at the big bounce, it starts expanding again. So if you look at what is happening in the future in loop quantum gravity, uh, the universe is actually contracting, reaches a finite non-zero uh, 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 volume up here, finite density, finite curvature, and then expands out again. So what happens is that quantum geometry really creates a new repulsive force, which overwhelms the usual gravitational attraction. If you go back in time, the repulsive force is completely negligible until you are very close to the bounds, but then, it really overwhelms the classical attraction and instead of continuing to zero volume, infinite curvature, the universe bounces. And the pre-Big Bang branch is joined to the post-Big Bang branch by a quantum mechanical bridge where quantum gravity effects are very important. But they're important in very, very small region up here. Afterwards, general relativity is again fine. So the cosmic microwave background and inflation are unaffected. And therefore, they are not proof that the Big Bang ever occurred. In this picture also, all these things are completely occurring. And this is just an example of what happens at neutron in astrophysics. Neutron stars and, and, and uh, white drops, for example, would not exist 
without quantum mechanical forces. And similar thing is true in our universe. But here, uh, the ideas are e much easier to understand. It has to do with quantum mechanics of matter, whereas in Big Bang, it has to do with the quantum mechanics of, of uh, geometry itself. So what Luke quantum gravity has done is to provide for us a quantum gravity completion of inflation. In inflationary scenarios, space-time is, is expanding the past. If you go back in the past, uh, it's expanding the future. If you go back in the past, the space-time, the, the, all the quantities diverge, space-time tears, doesn't make sense anymore, and that is a big bang. That is replaced by this big bounce up here. And then one could actually see so there are observational consequences of this finite bounce. Instead of big bang, you've got a finite bounce. There are observational con consequences. And this is something that I could have referred to that appeared, for example, I mean, the, the, the continuous series of papers on this, there are literally thousands of papers, but the one that I'm talking about has to do with physical, about a year ago in physical review letters that really showed that there are some anomalies in this cosmic wave microwave background. By and large, the inflationary scenarios explain the cosmic microwave background observations very well. But there are some small aspects which cannot be explained. And those are explained in the quantum gravity. These anomalies are naturally explained or elevated. They don't exist in loop quantum cosmology. And the successes of standard inflation are still let left alone. And so therefore there is a possibility of having quantum gravity in sky. And there are a lot of, you'll find in the press, if you look at the cosmic tango between the very small and the very large or in cosmology, you'll find a lot of articles in the popular press about this result that, that I mentioned in the last transparency, namely this physical review letters. And it is called the cosmic tango because the, on the one hand, loop quantum gravity resolves the Big Bang singularity by changing physics at the very small distances, which are called ultraviolet. But surprisingly, these modifications affect the cosmological perturbations, the quantum fields, which are supposed to be in the vacuum in the beginning. Those cosmological perturbations, which give rise to large scale structure later on, they are affected only if they have very, very long wavelengths. And therefore there's an interplay between the very small and the very large, and that is called the cosmic tango. So let me summarize and then we can have questions. General relativity is a deep and marvelous theory. It's conceptually compact, supremely beautiful, and accounts for many fascinating astrophysical phenomena. In cosmology, it says that given the observed tiny inhomogeneities in the CMB of the young universe, GR successfully predicts the large scale structure that, that we observe some 14 billion years later. However, as Akram has sort of emphasized, GR is incomplete because it ignores quantum physics that is crucial in the very early universe. And the prediction of the Big Bang, which, which ignores quantum physics, arises because when it ignores quantum physics, cannot be trusted. Impressive advances over the past two decades have occurred both on observational and theoretical front. And by taking into account the quantum physics of cosmological classical space-time, inflation leads to successful paradigm to account for the tiny fluctuations in the CMB era that GR needs as input. But because in inflation, space-time is classical, the Big Bang still persists. Physics just stops there. So even with inflation, we have incompleteness. And for conceptual coherence of fundamental laws, we need even a grander, deeper theory from which general relativity and known physics can emerge as limiting cases. And this is quantum gravity. And look, quantum gravity is an example. What I find very attractive about look, quantum gravity is that it starts out with deep conceptual questions like question of time, entropy, various, various deep conceptual questions, the nature of space time geometry, the microstructure and so on. It needs new mathematics to understand these structures, but at the end of the day, it also makes contact with observations. So it is not, in string theory, for example, it's very difficult to make contact with observations. 
Um, so Einstein's continuum is an approximation which breaks down near the Big Bang and LQG does not break down. There is no initial singularity. The Big Bang is replaced by Big Bounce. And there is brand new physics in the Planck regime and it provides a coherent completion of the inflationary paradigm and a radical change in the initio of the origin. And Lemaitre himself has said that scientific progress is the discovery of more and more comprehensive simplicity. So this is what happened when going from Newtonian physics to general relativity, from the general relativity paradigm to inflationary paradigm where quantum fields were important. And again, from in quantum field theory in curved space-time paradigm to loop quantum gravity where the space-time geometry itself is quantum mechanical in nature. So let me stop here. And those students and so on who are, might be interested can look at many outreach papers, uh, clips and videos on loop quantum gravity, that some of them are extremely good. So I really encourage you to look at that. And that is our you know, outreach pages of gravity.psu.edu. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Abhay Ashikar. I mean, uh, I think you start from general relativity and cosmology application, cosmological application and uh, the solution, uh, I mean, with um, LQG, which is very interesting. I mean, um, because uh, LQG does not uh, cost too much prizes, like for example, string theory, you need uh, advanced uh, machinery and you add more things, but uh, in uh, loop quantum gravity, it's, uh, I mean, one of the theories which you don't need to add, um, I mean, too much uh, mathematical machinery. But just, uh, I was, uh, before we go to the uh, audience questions, um, well, because our audience, as I said, some of them are public, some of the, the others are graduate students and professors. So uh, um, when you were, I mean, at 1978 or um, when you were at uh, University of Chicago and uh, you are really thinking about the problem of quantum gravity. So what's your starting point? Is it, as they said, is it... Uh, the Wheeler, the Witt equations, uh, or what's your st starting point? And uh, the second, um, I mean, uh, uh, point or second question, which is interests me. As you said, Newton, for example, think about the force is um, something mysterious between, I mean, uh, two objects. Einstein changed the uh, notion of uh, the force uh, as uh, the curvature uh, uh, of uh, the space time and the gauge uh, field theories, or when you add in uh, um, uh, quantum field theory or gauge field theories, they change also the notion, the force that is equal to uh, what's uh, the geometry plus uh, uh, symmetry. So um, at some point, I mean, do you think after, I mean, thinking about Wheeler, the Witt equations uh, for the first part, did you, think that the problem at that time was to introduce or to include the gauge symmetry in uh, the uh, Einstein theory because it was not clear how to uh, uh, add uh, th this uh, gauge symmetry? Right. So the starting point was, um, I mean, you're right. In fact, one of the first papers I wrote uh, in Chicago was actually a review article on quantum gravity. And that was because I wanted to learn about gravity and so on and so forth. Um, the, and I, I, since I came from gravity background as opposed to particle physics background, I did not want to use the perturbative field theory. I did not want to use a flat space and small perturbations of that because I knew already at that time that the most dramatic predictions of general relativity are really in the strong field regime where perturbation theory is not very good. Okay. So therefore, the natural idea was not so much wheeler debit equation, but canonical quantum quantization, which is really something that was started by Dirac, and then Bergman, and then ADM, Arnovid, Des, and Misner, and then Wheeler and Debit, and all these people together. So that was a natural idea to sort of think about, because it did, did not require you to split space-time into a flat background and a perturbation. What they dealt with the curve, geometry all at once from the beginning. But then there were several things that were added, but I think the two most important things are the following. The first is what you said, namely the 
ad, namely gauge theory idea. So in general relativity, the basic dynamical variable that Einstein introduced was a space-time metric. But in gauge theories, which govern the other three interactions of nature, the strong interaction, the electroweak interaction, so these, these three forces of nature, there the fundamental object is not a metric, but is a vector potential, or more precisely, a connection, which takes values in the algebra of a group, which actually enables you to parallel transport various objects. In, in electromagnetism, we parallel transport the wave function of a charged electron, for example. And that to do that, we need the vector potential of the electromagnetic field. In QCD, we parallel transport the wave function of the quark. And for that, we need the gluon vector field. But in general relativity, the object was completely different. And therefore, one of the motivations for me was to find a dis description of general relativity, which emphasized the ideas of connection or vector potentials more over the notion of a space-time metric. And then what do we parallel transport? Well, next in, in, the, in the new variables that I introduced, what one parallel transports are left-handed chiral formula. So these are left-handed particles of the standard model. So there was a shift of emphasis from metrics to connections. Many years later, I found out almost accidentally that both Einstein and Schrodinger had also tried a similar, similar reformulation in the late 40s of general relativity in terms of connections, but they were using Levitivita connections. And then the theory actually became in some ways more, more complicated. The Lagrangian was not polynomial and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas in, if you use the spin connections, then, um, then the, the theory actually simplifies. So the first ingredient, new ingredient, was really looking for this uh, spin connection. And the second ingredient that came to me was from Roger Penrose's crystal theory, Ted Newman's so-called edge space theory, and Plabansky's um, ideas about self-dual fields. So there was just a mathematical development that had happened, which showed that just mathematically, there is an integrable sector of general relativity. And therefore, I thought that not only should we use these vector potentials or connections, but we should use connections which are adapted to self-duality. And this connection I just told you, which enables you to parallel transport of a chiral fermion is such connection. So the convergence of ideas coming from twisted theory of Roger Penrose's and other and related ideas and gauge series together. But the important thing is that in none of these did we modify general relativity. It is still general relativity. We did not change theory. For example, Yang had a theory of gravity, which was also based on connection, but it was a different theory. Whereas here, it is just classically general relativity. It is just that the connection variables bring out some structures which are classically not that important, but which open a gateway to quantum physics, to microscopic description. So that was what was done. I think, uh, Professor, there is a last thing, uh, and I think we can't go to the direct, uh, directly to the question of the audience, but there is one thing. So at some point, if you go uh, at the deep level, I mean, and you see the classical mechanics, and you see also the gauge field theories, and you see also general relativity, you will find some, uh, I mean, deep connection or fundamental connections, which is differential geometry, but different mathematical tools. Right. Hello? Akram, you are frozen. It seems that we lost connection with uh, Dr. Akram, but I think we can answer the question. Professor. But he did not really finish the question. So what we could do is perhaps take the question from the audience and we'll come back to Akram. Okay. okay, so we'll start some questions with the audience. First question will be from Mr. Hussein, according to the queue. So uh, Mr. Hussein al Khalidi, a short introduction uh, of yourself and the question that you would like to ask. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, welcome, sir Ashtikar. Uh, Thank you. And uh, I am so happy to talk uh, to you. And uh, I, uh, I have a view some, uh, I have uh, a few questions. The first, 
How did Dr. Ashti Carr get to this equation? And uh, how do I understand the universe without time? <clears throat> okay? Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me just answer this uh, question. The second, the second, yeah, 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 yeah. The second uh, question, uh, what exactly does mass mean in general uh, relativity? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ashtika. Okay, so the first question about um, how did I arrive at these equations? And as I said, the input was from various directions. It was not a linear thing. It took me many years. I was struggling. I was trying to understand uh, how, how, to, how to best describe classical general relativity. In the yeah. way that might be most easiest to go to quantum theory with completely new techniques without perturbation things. So that is what I was really trying to, trying to understand. The issue of time is really has to do with, for me, the the best way to face it is that at a fundamental level, there is no time. So if you look at the quantum mechanical description of the wave function of geometry and matter, it is just one equation. There is no time evolution there. It is just the equation, which is the loop quantum cosmology analog of the Vila David equation, if you like. But what you can do is you can choose one of the classical, one of the fields as a clock and say, how do other things change with respect to it? This is the Leibniz Leibnizian point of view that Akram referred to in the introduction. And that is what we do. We sort of take one of the objects, one of the fields as a clock, there are criteria about what is a good clock, etc. that's technical. But then with respect to it, then how do other things evolve? And the simple idea is the following, that in, the, in nature, there isn't sort of a grandfather time which is picking away what you wanted. But what we have is, really, for example, I can ask the question. There is no absolute time, but I can use the, um, the, the orbit of the moon around Earth as one unit of time. And then I can ask the question about how long does it take for the earth to go around the sun? And then I would say, well, what is your unit? Well, the unit was the first one. Namely, it's a physical unit. It's not an abstract unit. It is how many times, how, how long does it take for the earth, for the moon to go around earth? So I'm just asking if the earth goes around the sun once, how many times has the moon go, gone around earth? And I get approximately 13. So I said 13 units. So it's a relational time. The, 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 the period of Earth around, around the sun becomes a direction. So, so that is what I'm, I'm really talking about. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you Dr. Rastika. Thanks, yeah. Thank, since we started to taking uh, the audience questions, I would like to... Uh, uh, Dr. I hope that just for the audience, it's maybe a personal, I mean, uh, favor. If you want, this is up to you because I mean, there is an interaction between audience and maybe they are first time to see you. If you can open the camera, I mean, for just the yeah. audience. Right. I, I, the thing is, I wanted to, but I, oh yeah, I can just stop the video. And then, I mean, I, I, the camera just went off because of the, I started the sharing screen and then it does not. Do you see it? Oh, okay. okay, okay, Professor. Thank you so much, I mean. Oh, you're welcome. So, uh, Ahmed, uh, we can go to the other questions of the yes. audience. Yes, let, me, let me remind the audience with uh, some rules. We have one minute for each question. So if you'd like to ask questions, try to uh, make them short and direct to the point. Uh, besides, you can ask your questions in Arabic or in English, whatever. حابب اذكر بالبداية باعتبار اننا ناخذ الاسئله من الاخوه الحضور الاساتذه الافاضل انه ممكن تسالوا السؤال بالعربي او بالانجليزي لا فرق الاريح لكم معنا خلينا نقول دقيقه لطرح الاسئله فلذلك حاولوا تكون الاسئله مباشره و تو ذا بوينت الى صلب الموضوع مباشره ناخذ سؤال من الدكتور حنا دكتور حنا تفضل مساء الخير مساء النور يا هلا جود ايفنينج بروفيسور اشتيكار and thank you very much for the interesting talk. Really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, uh, it concerns uh, dark energy and dark matter. 
Uh, how can uh, the quantum loop gravity account for these two components of the universe? Uh, I mean, dark matter and dark energy. And how success successful is it in explaining uh, these phenomena? Thank you very much. They are very nice questions. Uh, loop quantum gravity does not address these questions. Loop quantum gravity is really addressing questions about, uh, uh, about the nature of space and time. And then what does it tell us about the rest of physics? So if you like, it's just like general relativity. General relativity does not say that there is dark matter. I mean, it, it allows dark matter, but it doesn't say what dark matter is or origin of dark matter is. So loop quantum gravity is very, it's, it's a bit like the quantum virtue is in fact the quantum virtue of general relativity. So it does not have, so far, it does not have direct predictions in particle physics or in, so at the moment, the, dark matter and dark energy are just inputs, they are just ingredients. They are not something that are derived from fundamental principles in the quantum gravity. Because that's just not, the, that's not how we, the loop quantum gravity started with, if you like, right? So, okay, thank you very much. But, thank but you. These are good questions. I mean, I, I'll just start, yeah. Thank you, Professor. We have a question. Uh, we'll try to make a balance between the audience who want to ask by audio and uh, audience who want to ask by writing. So we have a question from Adil Sahila. I hope that I pronounced the name correctly. What, why is it essential to introduce the Imerisi parameter okay. to quantum gravity? Very nice, very nice question. So the point is the following, that in answer to the previous question, I, I mentioned that in fact, this description of general relativity we use is like in gauge theories. And now, if you look at gauge theory, for example, the QCD, quantum chromodynamics, it describes the Young's theory. And then there's a fundamental Lagrangian there, which, F, which is just F squared, trace of F squared. But then you can also add a topological term to it, FF star. And that does not change the equations of motion, but it changes quantum mechanics. And classically, it doesn't make any difference, but quantum mechanically, it does make a difference because if you like, Quantum mechanically, you don't have to be on shell. You don't have to satisfy the quantum mechanical classical equation of motion. You allow fluctuations around off the classical equations of motion. And so that gives rise to so-called theta sectors in Q QCD. And then theta is a new parameter of QCD, which is not the existing classical theory. And, but quantum mechanically, it has, it has effects. And then one actually sees what uh, can measure that theta angle by measuring some observables because observables, quantum mechanically, observables depend on theta. Classically, none of the observables depend on theta. Mm -hmm. Now, in general relativities, very similar. If you think of general relativity in the gauge theory language, then you've got a Lagrangian, but then you can add to it term which does not change equations of motion. So in that sense, it is topological, if you like. And then there's a coefficient of that term, and that is a barbaro immediate parameter. Classically, it doesn't matter. Classically, this term does not contribute because it does not contribute to the equations of motion. But quantum mechanically, it becomes important because quantum mechanically, you are not on shell classically. And then the quantum observables can determine, uh, will depend on the value of this immediate parameter. Ideally, one sh should just be able to measure some observable and determine this parameter. But we don't have Planck scale technology. We cannot do those measurements yet. So what we do is really use some thought experiments like what is the entropy of a black hole to determine this barbarian energy parameter. Mm -hmm. So the parameter comes because in gauge theories, one can add terms to the action which do not change classical physics, but do change quantum mechanical physics. And the same thing is happening in general relativity because we formulate it as a gauge theory. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Shangi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بدي أحكي بلغة العربية. السؤال مباشرة في تجربة ميكلسون مورلي في البحث عن الأثير لم لم يتم رصد أي تغيير في الطول الموجي لأنه ممكن يكون ال كان الزمن كتير قديم ما في تجارب ما في أجهزة حديثة ولكن في تجربة رصد الحقوق الجاذبية تم رصد التغيير في الطول الموجي السؤال هو ما الفرق بين التجربتين بالضبط؟ 
والسؤال الثاني عند اكتشاف الامواج الجاذبيه لماذا لم يعد هو الاثير؟ وشكرا لم يعد هو ماذا الجزء الاخير اخي لو تعيد سنين لم يعد هو ماذا؟ هو الاثير آه، يعني عند اكتشاف الامواج الجاذبيه آه. لماذا لم يعد هو الاثير؟ تمام yes. So do you want me to translate uh, or you It's okay whatever you want Okay Professor Ashtika Yeah um, yes so uh, the question of uh, uh, Mr Shaheen he said that in uh, Michelson Morley experiment I mean we didn't realize the changing of uh, 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 of uh, the wavelength But I mean, in the discovery of uh, the gravitational waves, I mean, we uh, discover this kind of, maybe we uh -huh. can say it's a redshift or change of wavelength. So maybe as, as uh, I understood his uh, um, uh, question, he said that why uh, in the detection of gravitational waves, I mean, we, uh, we uh, don't use this ether term, or I don't know, maybe I, I, I am right, I mean, in the second, uh, I mean, in the description of the question. Okay, so the first, I, I don't know, so if, as I understand the question then, okay. the, the, the change that we see in gravitational wave ex experiment, the change in the length that we're seeing in gravitational wave experiment is absolutely minuscule compared to You know what we would have seen if there was ether and the Michelson model experiment. It's completely so it's a completely different order of magnitude. It is really because the space time geometry itself is changing, which of course, Michelson model experiment, this was not happening. If you like, if you are performing a Michelson model experiment today, and if your sensitivity was as big as, as, uh, uh, as LIGO detectors, then one would see those changes. Right? And those changes, however, are not because of motion in ether, but just because, because if there's motion in ether, I should see it continuously change, right? I mean, I should see it changing all the time, whereas what we see is only when LIGO event takes place, when there's some black hole merger happening somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, before, Ahmed, if I have just, uh, because I have one point before the internet cutting, if I can just you allow me to continue Please. this part, yes. So as I said, professor in classical mechanics, I, we use symplectic, um, I mean, uh, geometry, which is, uh, I mean, a sort of differential geometry. And we use this, uh, I mean, cotangent bundle uh, manifold and we use the symplectic form. And if you want to discretize, I mean, the energy, you discretize this uh, structure, this in the classical mechanics. I mean, if you go to the gauge field theories, I mean, you have, I mean, the same idea, but here you have an internal space and you have what's called the, the, the notion of the connection. Uh, and if you go to the general relativity, you will have a real space time and the metric. So it's a little bit, I mean, there is a similarity between the classical mechanics, uh, this geometry, but this is uh, a geometry of the phase space and the symplectic forms. And here in gauge field theories, it's internal space and use gauge connections. But in general relativity, you are dealing with a, a, a physical entity, which is space time and the metric. So do you think that this is the problem? Because for me at the deep level, I see them all the same, I mean, but different tools of mathematics. This you use phase space, this internal space, but this is Uh, the space time itself this is the uh, uh, what's called the uh, symplectic form this is connections and this is matrix so what do you think about this thing yeah so i mean yeah i, I think that you no know, geometry is useful in multiple ways as you say in classical mechanics the symplectic part of the geometry and then there is a fiber bundles and connections in gauge theory and then there's human in geometry in general the, the usual formulation of general relativity But I think when you got cut, I, I explained also that uh, uh, one of the main points was to formulate general relativity as a theory of connections. So basically really bring it, if you like, not having this disparity, but really bringing them together in, the, in this sense. And that is why uh, we had uh, uh, the, the geometry that one uses in, uh, in, in, uh, in loop quantum gravity is really the geometry of connections. That is on the forefront. And, metric is regarded as an emergent quantity. 
is a derived or secondary quantity up here. And that also enables someone to unify all interactions because in all interactions of nature now, not only electroweak and strong, but also in gravity, uh, the microscopically fundamental variable is really a connection and geometry at this level is a useful but secondary quantity. Of course, classically, it's, just, it's very, very useful, but it's a bit like saying that classically, Newtonian potential is very, very useful, uh, but you know, general relativity is, is not fundamental quantity. That's, uh, so, that, so, and then finally, in, um, in quantization, we very strongly use synthetic methods. You know, because there's a pre-quantization idea, synthetic methods, and so on and so forth. So various facets of geometry are intertwined in, in loop quantum gravity. If you like, there is a theory of connections part, then there is a phase space of the theory of connections on which you have synthetic structure and these topological terms come and so on and so forth. And these topological terms change what you mean by the momentum canonically conjugate to the connection, for example. And that is where the Barbary Mirzi parameter comes from. And then uh, there is a, uh, the metric is considered to be derived quantity, a secondary quantity, which comes from the, the momentum conjugate to the connection, uh, which is of course very special of, the, of gravity, that the momentum conjugate to connection has some interpretation in terms of space-time geometry. But I think the, the connection part of the geometry is taken as fundamental. Well. Yes, uh, Professor, the, the follow up just uh, of this uh, point, and maybe um, for me, I am done. I mean, with you, so we can. So, uh, for the discretization of the manifold, I mean, usually when I uh, saw many works, I mean, of uh, like Frieda's, Florian, Mighty, and the others, one, I mean, they took sometimes different approach. So, uh, sometimes they took, but um, uh, manifold without boundaries. So uh, at uh, one of the papers, they took Chen Simons, uh, polarization and discretize, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the manifold. But at some point I was thinking, uh, and tell me this, is it right or wrong? So um, at some point, if we want to put a boundary for our manifold, I, I mean, with the Chen Simon polarizations, and uh, you add what you use, if you know, Professor uh, Sharon Simon, Wes uh, Zumino Witten uh, duality, which is CSWZW. So, do you think uh, when you use this duality and you put the, on the boundaries the Chan Simons, and uh, you can go from Chan Simon to WZW, which is two dimensional conformity theory, do you think that we can go? Um, uh, to introduce the holographic principle at the level of LQG? I think so. I think that's something like that is, is in principle quite, quite feasible. And more recently, people like Laura and his group are actually doing this holographic principles using precisely theories with finite boundaries. So I think you could just look at their papers, for example. They do talk about holography. They do talk about finite boundaries nowadays, last, last couple of years. So, so they are doing this work. But we can continue to talk about this because this is a little bit technical, so I, that's why I'm hesitating going into too many details about this because the rest of the audience will be somewhat lost, I think. So. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you, Professor. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions about time. What uh, what okay. is time? Uh, how uh, can we show that time starts with the Big Bang? Is it really starts with the Big Bang? So, so how can we answer okay. these kind of questions? Yes, please. Okay. So the, the thing is that these questions have to be answered within the context of a theory, not abstractly. I mean, as far as physics is concerned, uh, philosophy, it might be different, but as far as physics is concerned, you have to answer it in the context of a theory. Mm -hmm. So if you like, in general relativity, there's Big Bang, and then one wants to say, does the time start with the Big Bang? Uh, the thing is that there's no actual time in general relativity anyway. So you could just declare that time was thousand years or so whatever unit you want to use at the Big Bang. There is no absolute time at all. But you know, since space-time general relativity sort of there is nothing before the Big Bang, it is just a natural convention to say that the t equal to zero at the Big Bang. But that doesn't tell us what the, the time is, so to say, for an arbitrary system at any you know at any instant, uh, at any event. The reason is because. The, you know, the clocks, for example, the rate at which clocks tick will depend on the trajectory that the clock takes, the gravitational field experiences and so on. 
So this might seem confusing because I was talking about the Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago and so on. So what did I mean by that? So there we're talking about averaged out time. We're not talking about time experienced by anyone clock, but we are talking about the time with respect to the macroscopic large scale structure of the universe. And there by convention, we take that time to be zero at the Big Bang. And then you know, there's homogeneity and isotropy and that does give you a notion of time which is valued at large scale. It doesn't have to be valued for solar system or for any given clock individually, but on a large scale, that makes sense. And when you talk about cosmology, we are referring to this macroscopic coarse grained notion of time. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we have some questions about the Big Bang and the Big Bounce. Can we show that before Big Bang that there was Big Bounce or things like that? I think you mentioned something about that in the lecture, but it could confirm that. So the statement is not that, the, the, the statement is just that there is no Big Bang in, in, in LQC. Big yeah. Bang is supposed to be, okay, let me start from scratch. Let me just, uh, in general relativity, by Big Bang, you mean absolute beginning at which physical quantities diverge. Mm -hmm. In LQC, physical quantities never diverge. So in that sense, there is no Big Bang. Mm -hmm. There's no absolute beginning, physical quantities don't diverge, there is um, now, in modern day cosmology, and there is actually a six minute video, if you like, you can, you can play it at the end. Uh, yes. I think Akram has it on the new meaning of Big Bang. And maybe people will like that because there are people like Penrose and Hawking and various other people who talk, talk about the new meaning of Big Bang. Um, so the new meaning of Big Bang is really not the absolute beginning of anything. It's just a hot phase in the early history of the universe. Mm -hmm. And the inflationary scenario then, this hot place, hot phase, in fact, after inflation, right? So mm -hmm. it is not the big bang of general relativity, which is kind of before inflation. It is just the hot phase of general relativity. So the meaning has now changed. So in loop quantum cosmology, if you want to say that there is a big bang, it is really in a new sense of the term that mm -hmm. just there was a hot phase. And that hot phase was after the big bounce, if you like. But it is not the beginning of the universe. It is not where space-time breaks down. It is not where uh, quantities become infinite. Mm -hmm. I think now it's clear. Uh, we'll have a question from Mr. Rahim. By the way, the video that you mentioned, we will uh, share it with the audience at the end of the lecture, so we can so, uh, see this uh, video. Mr. Rahim, if you have a question, yes, please. Uh, hello, thank you, Professor Ashtikar. Welcome. I have uh, two questions. The first one, uh, the first question is uh, about the uh, texture of space time. So, uh, can we apply the Newton's third law on the space time texture? So, if we apply mass to the space time, will the space time have a reaction equal, equally in magnitude and opposite in direction for that mass? And will that change anything? Uh, if space-time has mass in itself? Um, I mean, Newton's laws, of course, are really in non-relativistic regime, right? I mean, so in order, you cannot take them literally, even in space and relativity. So if you want to say that, uh, ascribe a mass to space-time, then that mass is just of the whole space-time, including the force that you are going to apply to the, to, to the, to what you wanted to say, mass. It includes everything. The, ma the mass of space time will include everything. So that is not, so in that case, nothing acts on that mass because everything is included, inc including the agency that you want to act by is included in the mass, if you like. Mm -hmm. So what you can do, so you have to change your question. You might say something like, well, supposing I've got a star or a black hole or something, and I, disturb it by throwing in a lot of radiation or throwing in a lot of garbage <laughs> into it. And then uh, can I, will there be effect uh, that, that, that uh, the mass, will that object like that mass, if like that black hole or star, will it be affected? The answer is yes. And you can work out how it will be affected. For example, uh, there is a Penrose process that you can actually take a black hole, which is rotating and by throwing in things in it, by it will react and uh, you can extract energy and angular momentum for the black hole but the black hole in that process will slow down 
And then finally, <laughs> you cannot keep doing it once it has no idea. So, firstly, I want to just uh, thank you and say thanks for uh, your time. Okay, so next question, maybe? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I... Can I have the second question? Yes, Prahim, go ahead. Yeah, so we can conclude. Yes. So we can conclude, Professor, from the first question that uh, space-time itself cannot react with a force on other masses. I, all the masses are included in space-time. Oh, okay. And the second question: If we stretch space-time, will Planck size get bigger, or is it just a theoretical idea uh, in physicists' minds? Um. So the statement is that the, the space-time can be stretched, right? Space-time can be stretched uh, even when it is, I mean, you could have surfaces which are, you cannot compress it for, forever. There are, these are cut off at small distances, it's, Planck, it's a Planck scale. But on the other hand, you, you, you can stretch the, 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 um, the physical objects in the space-time, which has given area, given volume, et cetera, that can grow. And that does grow in loop on gravity, for example, near the Big Bang, where in the Planck regime, everything curvature is Planck, Planck scale, and yet uh, things change in time. So things can be stretched, things can be compressed, but there's a limit to how much you can compress. Uh -huh. there's, not, there's no obvious limit to how much you can stretch, but there's a limit to how much you can compress because of the, this repulsive force that I just mentioned in passing. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much, sure. Professor. Uh, there is a question, or maybe more than one question actually, about the speed of light and the other fundamental constants. Why nature choose these this values for these constants? Well, that's a good question, but on the other hand, you know, physics never answers why. Physics, yes. the goal of physics is to answer how. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we, I mean, why is left in the domain of you know, oh. metaphysics or you know, philosophy or something else. And physics does not answer the question of why something is the way it is, but rather how, how, how is it that you know, the earth actually rotates with a given period? Or how is it that uh, there are, um, uh, I mean, this does not answer the question, why is there earth? This mm -hmm. can answer the question, how was earth formed? And this is an answer. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Muhammad, you have a question? Yes, please. Mr. Muhammad. Muhammad and then... Yes, I have. You see, Muhammad, I don't know who he is. Uh, so. uh, sorry, Muhammad okay. Ahmed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, first, I want uh, to thank you uh, for this uh, perfect presentation. So, uh, sir, my question is about uh, M theory and uh, quantum theory, uh, gravity. I mean, uh, do we can now say that we have uh, a unified theory uh, in physics which can describe every phenomenon or still there are a problem, sir? Yeah. So, as far as M theory is concerned, um, this is supposed, this, this is an outgrowth of string theory. But as you probably know, one doesn't know exactly what M theory is. And in fact, sometimes people say M stands for mystery. Um, so at one stage, there was a great hope in the string community that it would give you a theory, which is a unified description of all of nature, all interactions, everything and everything. And some very, very bold people were even saying that, well, string theory will explain why poet, poets write poetry and which particular poetry they write and so on and so forth. But those hopes to answer your question are not realized. And furthermore, there's a wide recognition even among leading string theorists that, that there's a new role for string theory, that the, fun, that the original goals of string theory, which is coming up with a coherent, consistent quantum theory of gravity, which is also unifies at the same time, all forces of nature, that dream has remained completely unfulfilled. But what has happened in string theory is rather 
that string theory has provided so many rich mathematical tools. The string theory has provided so many rich mathematical tools that it is being used. These tools are being used on a variety of uh, branches of physics, you know, like from QCP, hydrodynamics, very various different branches of physics. So its new role is really that of a valuable modern toolbox. And this is not just my view. This is also a view that is really coming from the Institute for Advanced Study, which is you know, kind of a prime place for string theory. Uh, if you go to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton webpage, and you will find uh, uh, an article there about the new role of string theory or new rebirth of string theory or something like that, which was written by the journalist in residence there. And she talks up, she has interviewed all the leading string theorists and they say exactly this, that string theory has now become, has, has assumed a new role, new rebirth, new resurgence as a box of very valuable tools, which is used all over, um, um, and all over physics and, and some branches of mathematics as well. So the answer to your question is no, we do not have, M theory has not given us the final theory of all unification and interactions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Ahmed, uh, yes, just, yes, there is a question from Rania Khalla. Uh, Rania Khalla? Yes. Please open the mic and ask your question, Rania. Yes, hello. Uh, hello, Professor Ashikar. Thank you very much. It's such an honor for me to be in your presentation. Uh, I have one question, and um, since I'm a bachelor of physics student, it might sound so simple. Um, uh, you have mentioned that uh, the inhomogeneity means that there is, or there are cooler and, um, and hotter regions. Um, and this is after the Big Bang. Uh, I read once that, um, at the Big Bang, uh, the universe appears so homogeneous. I just want to ask why. Why is the distant universe appears homogeneous at the Big Bang? And thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. But again, you know, physics doesn't really answer the question why in some ways, but physics answers how and you know what is happening, etc. Et so our current understanding is that indeed. The, in the very early universe was extremely homogeneous, extremely homogeneous. Um, but it cannot be completely homogeneous. Completely homogeneous would mean that the density of matter, just let's talk about density of matter just for a second, is just uniform, is exactly the same everywhere. And, 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 but what happens is that because of quantum mechanics, we know that there are going to be quantum fluctuations. You cannot remove them even in principle. Classically, you can remove them, but quantum mechanically, you cannot remove them. And that really follows from the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg's. And so there are these very, very tiny fluctuations in the, in the, early, in the very early universe, which are quantum mechanically in origin. So if you like, to first order, it looks extremely homogeneous, but, but the point is that then this tiny, Planck, uh, the, the tiny inhomogeneities, which are really at, at the quantum scale, during inflation, they get stretched mm -hmm. and become larger scale, uh, not, not a quantum scale, but larger scale. And then they are imprinted on the cosmic microwave background. So again, cosmic microwave background then is not homogeneous. It has some fluctuations in densities, but these really originated from fluctuations that you cannot even in principle remove in physics because they, are con because they have to do with Heisenberg uncertainty principle. As I was saying, like for electromagnetic field, classically electric field can be zero, magnetic field can be zero, that is one possibility. But quantum mechanically, we know this, it has been tested. Quantum mechanically, you cannot set both of them to zero. There are extremely small but tiny fluctuations. And mm -hmm. so when you say what happened in the very early universe, there were these extremely small tiny fluctuations because you cannot even in principle remove them. And they have grown to these homogeneities. But even in the cosmic microwave background, these inhomogeneities 
are only one part into the 10 to the minus four, one part in 10,000. They're very, very tiny in homogeneities that are, that are present there. But then under the influence of gravity, that is the amazing thing that they grow. So to me, it is truly amazing. And this is something that we have only heard, learned in the last 30 years, you know, given the long history of human beings, last 30 years, we are lucky to be alive at that time. We only learn now that quantum mechanical fluctuations actually through the inflation and then astrophysics are really responsible for the large scale structure that we see in the universe. So to me, this is very fascinating. So to basic answer to your question is, yes, the universe is extremely homogeneous in the very, very early universe, but not completely homogeneous because quantum mechanics just forbids it. Yes, Professor. Um, fortunately, there is a lot of questions. This means that the audience is interacting with the lecture and having and more enthusiastic to get more information about physics in general. But unfortunately, we exceeded the limit of the time that we set to our lecture. So unfortunately, we cannot answer all questions. So it was a great opportunity to meet you, Professor. It's a great honor for all of us to have this great lecture. Uh, I would like to thank all the audience for being patient and being with us for this long time. Uh, حابب نهاية نحن للأسف تجاوزنا الوقت uh, بعرف إنه كان في لسه العدد منيح من الأسئلة سواء الأشخاص رايحين uh, يدهم طيبين دور بالكلام أو كاتبين أسئلة مكتوبة للأسف الوقت uh, تجاوزنا ونحن أصلا تجاوزنا الحد اللي كان مقرر لهذه المحاضرة كانت فرصة رائعة اللقاء بالبروفيسور أشتكار uh, فرصة جيدة ورائعة أن نلتقينا فيكم جميعا وحضراتكم صبرتوا معنا حتى نهاية هذه المحاضرة اللي طالت أكثر من كان الوقت المقرر uh, Dr. Akram, uh, okay. uh, Professor Abhay, thank you so much. I mean, for accepting my invitation, it was really a great honor. I mean, uh, also to promote, as I said, the knowledge um, uh, in the Arabic uh, society in this field. And uh, uh, really, I mean, uh, you discuss a lot of areas in theoretical physics, I mean, from a general relativity um, to uh, look quantum gravity and going through cosmology and the solutions uh, of actual problems using uh, uh, LQG. I mean, thank you so much. I hope uh, to see you after, as I said, I think after the next guest will be Carlo Rovelli and maybe after also Francesca Vidotto, maybe at some point I will uh, made, uh, I mean, another meeting with LQG guys, you and Carlo and other people, I mean. So thank you so much again, Professor, for your precious time. And um, yeah, I, I wish you also more scientific achievements. And um, so have a nice day, Professor. Thank you. Okay, so let me just say it was a pleasure for me to interact with you all. I am totally delighted by the interest that is widespread. And you know, I'm happy to have contributed to, to, to this interest. And if there is anything I can do to further enhance uh, these frontiers of science, this, my particular areas of frontiers of science uh, in the Arabic world, I'd be very, very glad to do that. I mean, so it, it is really my pleasure and thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so bye much. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So you can end now, Ahmed. I mean, yes.